more exchange rates. So we defined what exchange rates were. Now why do they change? Well, we have at least two important theories, and I'm not going to lie, they're completely unrelated, so this gets complicated pretty quick. One of the theories is purchasing power parity, PPP, has its own abbreviation, so clearly it's important. This is the idea that tradable goods should tend to cost about the same in different countries, because basically otherwise people can make a profit by importing or exporting them. Um, you know, if you have family in another country, you probably dealt with requests to bring like electronics or fashion items or certain things that are, you know, uh, back home when you visit or vice versa, right? Because you, so you've probably done a little bit of this arbitrage. Um, and, you know, again, there are complicated ways that big companies want to make it difficult to do that. But, you know, for a lot of things, because, you know, some, in some sense, like, you know, mobile phones are a little bit difficult to move around, or companies make it difficult to move around. Uh, but, you know, plenty of other things. People can and do make a profit by importing or exporting if there's a difference in the prices. So in the long run, we might expect that exchange rates are going to move so that tradable goods cost a similar amount of money. And again, I say similar because, you know, not everything is easy to trade. Bricks maybe are just you're not going to put a load, a ton of bricks on a plane just to make whatever a penny a brick. Uh, you know, that's not going to. But you know, things that are relatively easy to move around. And like I said again, there's, this is a game that manufacturers often do not want. That you know, uh, medicine is a classic example that it has quite a high value. It's relatively easy to move around, but you know, for a variety of reasons that they try to make that difficult. Um, you know, regulation and safety and whatever. So this is not saying all the time, everywhere, but it's saying, you know, in general, there's going to be this tendency. Um, now, again, and there are, like I said, there are lots of goods which are not easily tradable. Service is particularly often difficult to trade. Um, or, you know, again, it may take a kind of a transformation of business processes in order to trade those. One kind of almost silly example, The Economist magazine puts out what they call the Big Mac Index, which just looks at simple question, okay, how much does a Big Mac cost in cities around the world? And look, you know, at that, because I mean, again, Big Mac is on one hand not tradable, like once it's made, it's going to get pretty cold by the time you get off the plane. Nobody gonna want that, but you know. On the other hand, you kind of you know, the the general idea is most of the stuff that goes into it is actually pretty easily tradable: beef, wheat, you know, ketchup. Um, you know, so generally, if some good has a price that's high in A, low in B, then people are going to buy low and sell high, and you know, so that will tend to increase the demand in country B which will tend to raise the price there and increase the supply in country A, and so lower the price there. So there's going to tend to be some sort of arbitrage. Now, again, with a lot of caveats and, you know, well, 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 it is difficult. So this theory may not be airtight. Well, we have another theory. I know, more. This is interest rate parity, which says that investors can buy bonds from domestic or various foreign governments, and those generally pay different interest rates. There are, like we said, enough forward um, transactions out there that they can lock in their return on either whichever they invest in. And so, again, we would expect that those will be some arbitrage to make those equivalent. For example, if E is currently, for some currency, I don't know, is 120 of the foreign currency per dollar, and say the dollar interest rate is 2.5%, and the foreign interest rate is 2%, then investors face a choice. Keep in dollars, buy the dollar bond, you know, at the end of the year, you get $102.5. Or 
Or you take that same $100, convert to foreign exchange, and then I have 12,000 of those foreign currency units. Invest those at 2%, you have 12,240 at the end of the year. Then you convert those back to dollars. So you get 12,240 divided by E at the end of the year. So what future value of E makes those two choices have the same value? Because if they're not have the same value, investors will choose the one that makes more money and that's gonna move prices. And now again, yes, for those of you who maybe done any currency exchange you're like mm, you're missing the fees and yes I'm ignoring those for now again because at the volumes that we're talking those you know again for fees are important for the little folk like you and me but uh, if you're a giant multinational corporation they're a lot smaller so interest rate parity maybe we can draw a picture here so start with 100 bucks Either follow the green line, keep it in dollars, greenbacks. So at the end of the year, I have 100 times 1 plus R. Or follow the blue line, go down, change to some foreign exchange, foreign currency. So I have 100 E units today. Call it E naught to distinguish that this is going to be today's exchange rate. And then time passes and so at the end of the year I have 100 times 1 plus RF the foreign interest rate times E naught and then I change that back into dollars so I divide by E1 where E1 is the rate at the end of the year so I have 100 times 1 plus RF times E naught over E1 dollars and again those numbers should be equal because if they were not equal somebody could make money by moving money around and we said fx markets move five trillion dollars a day so yeah there's a lot of money available to be moved around so like i said we're going to differentiate between e0 the exchange rate now e naught because i'll call it and e1 the exchange rate in one year and again differentiate between the domestic interest rate rd and the foreign interest rate rf so you know, I get this equation that 1 plus RD should equal E0 over E1 times 1 plus RF, which is either referred to as covered interest rate parity or uncovered, depending whether I can lock in those forward exchange rates. You know, for relatively thinly traded foreign exchange, you know, if I want to go to whatever currency, some tiny little country uses, then you may not be able to buy those forward. But generally, for the big currencies, you can't. So consider, for example, if the foreign interest rate is higher, if RF is greater than RD, then what has to happen to make that equation hold? Well, you stare at it, and you say, well, that means that E0 over E1 has to be less than 1, right, in order to make that arbitrage equation hold which means that e is going to rise right because e1 is bigger than e0 so the dollar is going to appreciate the foreign currency depreciates so you know it's kind of this idea of there has to be a trade-off if the foreign interest rate is high then that implies that the foreign currency is expected to depreciate in order to sort of balance those out um, and vice versa again if the foreign interest rate is lower, then the foreign currency is expected to appreciate. Now, part of the reason to go through all this mess, it's kind of fun, is also to realize the kind of the limits of this, that you know, all this depends on being able to arbitrage, being able to buy and sell currencies. That's not always very easy. You know, some countries basically in order to make keep their interest rates different from sort of the world interest rates, they're going to restrict transactions. And so it makes it difficult for people to make these arbitrage trades. 